Our story starts on the drawing board of Harmon Palmer in 1887. Palmer is working on an idea to mechanically produce hollow concrete building block. He patents an early version of his machine and starts building homes around Chicago. Finding success, he refines his design and in 1900 reveals his all-new cast iron contraption to the world. This early invention is considered the very first modern machine for making concrete block. His straightforward, practical invention marks the start of a whole new industry. Soon, imitators take on his technology. In just seven short years, over a hundred companies have copied his invention. Most follow Palmer's basic idea, a metal frame, a mold box, and a hand release, with just some slight variations. Threats in trade publications and even lawsuits against building owners can stop the flood of Palmer clones from entering the marketplace. The public's appetite for this all-new, modern building material is challenging quarried stone and brick. Early concrete masonry is molded to look like the products they are replacing. Rockface is most popular. The rusticated look provides the appearance of hand-cut stone for a fraction of the cost. Soon, concrete block homes, churches, and commercial buildings are being built from coast to coast. Many architects of the day judge rock face block stiff, unnatural, and ugly. But those concrete block critics can't stop an entire industry from being built, literally one block at a time. This is Doug Ross at the NCMA lab. With this particular machine, we have a face uh, design that's in the machine. They would eyeball the moisture content, uh, and that's very crucial to uh, the making of the block. Then you put the remaining part of your mix in the mold and tamp it down between the, the core bar and all around, and just continue to fill the mold and tamp it until it's full. Once it's full, you take the handle, pull the bar back out, which allows you to pull the whole mold will rotate upward. It's very labor-intensive work. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty that's hard labor. In this era of hand-tamped machinery, a three-man crew working on a machine like this crank out about 200 block in a 10-hour day. By 1910, a thousand producers have geared up to meet the public demand, setting up shop in woodsheds and backyards across the country. Advertising of the day highlights the relative simplicity to make the product. This attracts fly-by-night manufacturers who sell poorly designed machinery to people looking to make a quick buck. They turn out shoddy block that can barely stay together. Many early units absorb water and crack in the first freeze. There's no standard for quality, size, or weight. Very quickly, block is gaining a negative reputation. One producer confesses to his peers that our early product has neither strength, stability, or good appearance. Block makers, machine manufacturers, and cement producers ultimately realize it's in their own best interest to bolster the reputation and quality of concrete block. In order to survive, they will have to come together. And a meeting of like minds is where our story really begins in the year 1918. At the end of World War I, the block industry is still very much a backyard operation. But flipping through faded trade publications of the late 1910s, you can see just how robust the concrete products industry is becoming. Ads for innovative new machinery fill the pages. Articles tout the success of concrete block in homes and commercial buildings. It's in one such journal we find reference to a new trade group called the Concrete Products Association. Founded on November 6, 1918, the new League of Producers makes its mission clear. Standardize specifications, exchange ideas, increase plant efficiency, and promote the merits of concrete masonry. The 1920s is considered our industry's golden decade. Throughout this period, the new association presses its members to define standards in block quality. Machine manufacturers improve upon those early hand-tamped machines. One innovator is Michigan's Jesse Besser. I used to hear stories about him going to the watch store and, and watching the gears turn and trying to understand how, how, how that works. And eventually, he turned that into a cam-driven block machine. Clearly very mechanical, always thinking about how to make concrete block. 
During the 20s, major milestones are met. In 1924, 8x8x16 is adopted as the standard unit size. Later that same year, 18 months of rigorous testing prove our product's ability to stand up to fire. During this period, further product innovations are made. Francis J. Straub sells millions of his lightweight block made with coal cinders. But for every advancement, there's a setback. The tremendous crowds which you see gathered outside the stock exchange are due to the greatest crash in the history of the New York Stock Exchange and market prices. They used to tell me I was building a dream. In 1929, the stock market crash leads to the shuttering of hundreds of block producers. Concrete block production skids from 387 million to just 45 million units. Many plants close and many others were idle. When the depression hit in 1929, uh, that's actually uh, when my father got his best start because nobody else was doing business and he got a job to, to build a church. It was probably the better part of a year's production of his machine. My father started the company in 1924 making a block on a uh, two at a time Sears and Roebuck machine and just developed from there. Construction is finally up following the Deep Depression. By the 1930s, changing tastes are beginning to make those rock face buildings from 1900 look old fashioned. Smooth block is the new style. Modern buildings are streamlined and designed to look like a nation working to rebuild its economy. To meet the demand, block are made faster on bigger and better machines. The association is also growing. In 1934, the membership adopts a familiar name that better reflects their mission, the National Concrete Masonry Association. The revived group works to change the poor impression of block dating back to the days of those early rock face units. In 1937, an ambitious 23-year-old named Fred Neth Sr. opens a small shop, Columbia Machine Works, in Vancouver, Washington. Fred begins repairing primitive hand-operated machines of the era. While learning the intricacies of these early apparatus, he decides he can build a better machine. I mean, very mechanically minded person. He could take a simple idea and, and run with it. And it didn't take much to, to turn it from design to concept. His company, along with that of Jesse Besser, go on to become the nation's equipment leaders, influencing decades of American concrete block production. By the 1940s, the production of concrete block is getting even faster. New vibrating machines are increasing productivity to roughly 600 units a day, and block making has become an essential major industry. But one writer calls this point in our history a period where we are still suffering with a minor league self-image anchored to the days of backyard production and industrial anarchy. As the nation enters a Second World War, the association splits from sister organizations and is already looking ahead to peacetime and the need to rebuild our manufacturing might. In 1942, the NCMA decides it's time to bring about greater prestige and respect for concrete block. The membership is told, our industry has come of age. It is no longer a backyard sand pile and hoe affair. It has sizable investments to protect it has a brilliant future to achieve. Our vital role in rebuilding America's industrial dominance is a topic we'll take on next time as the National Concrete Masonry Association looks back on 100 years of service.